cloud. Excellent. All right, my friends, welcome to Nebula um, week hmm, three, is it? You don't know? Four? Four? Okay, welcome to we Nebula week four, your Open Science 101 training. We're going to be talking about code, I believe now. Is that right, Johanna? Yep, that's okay. right. Excellent. I love it when I promise the truth. <laughs> so we're going to run through some of our usual reminders. Uh, we've already said webcams off or on. Either is fine. Uh, recordings will go on YouTube. Captions are available through the YouTube caption, not the YouTube, the Zoom caption facility. So if you want to follow along, perhaps you're hard of hearing, perhaps you're somewhere where it's really quiet um, and you can't actually listen, uh, please do use the captions. Um, and because we have a mixture of people participating from different places, we offer two ways to handle breakout rooms. One way to participate in breakout rooms is speaking, like I am right now. But if you prefer to write, then you're very welcome to write instead. Um, either of those are welcome options. And the easiest way for us to sort you into the correct rooms when we get to breakout rooms is um, by adding a W for written or S for spoken, depending on your preferences, to the front of your name. So I have opened the participants list in my Zoom and looked at my name. And right beside my name, I've clicked on the more button and clicked rename. And you've all heard me speak far too much, so I'll go for a written breakout room today. Um, but of course, if you can't edit your name, that's fine. Uh, you could do like one someone has just done at the minute. Edmund, thank you. Tell us what, what's needed in the chat and one of the hosts will automatically edit your name for you. Um, last reminder before I hand it over to my fellow colleagues is code of conduct. Be awesome to one another. That doesn't matter whether you're writing, whether you're speaking, whether you're reading the notes or whether you're using the Zoom chat or something else. Um, we ask that you treat one another with the respect that you would like to receive and that you would like others to give you. Um, and if at any point you feel like people haven't been holding to that uh, behavior, then the way that you can ask for us to do something about that or let us know so we can, we, we can try and uh, reduce the likelihood of it happening in the future is by emailing either team at weareols.org or individually you can email myself, uh, Malvika or Irene, and our email addresses are on lines 41 and 42 of the notepad right now. Um, I think that's plenty of me. Uh, Esdras, would you like to uh, kick us off, please? Okay. Welcome again, everyone, and thank you, you for giving me this opportunity once more to facilitate this session. Today, we will study about um, open code, I guess, yeah, I'm sure. And we have an amazing presenter today, Joanna. I still remember the last presentation from the previous call. It was simply mind-blowing and really thought-provoking. So I can promise you that you're going to have a really great session. I would like to give you a little bit of advice before we start. Like I said again, we're going to work on our personal projects. Like this is the purpose. We are working on research and projects. And I really encourage you to try as much as possible to find questions that are directly related to your research project or to your project while the presenter is presenting. This is a unique opportunity to ask questions from an expat and get responses that will help you to immediately apply and work ahead with your project. So without any further ado, I would like to pass the microphone to Joanna to introduce the presentation of today. Hello, Joanna. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about open code. Um, can I maybe get a quick reaction, like who is working with code in the project? Like it can be like a, you know, any reaction just from that I see um, how many people actually work with code. Yes, I see some reactions. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, that's all right. Like, um, so we are going to talk about code and it doesn't really matter if you've never written any software or any code. 
Um, but I would like you to, yeah, my, my, my kind of role is here to kind of to introduce you to that um, or at least how to work with it. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Let me see. That is now probably a bit of an inception moment. Sorry for that. Um, yeah, so um, this presentation will have two parts. The first one is an introduction to open code. And the second one is how to uh, use open code. Um, and uh, so the slides for this presentation are can be found um, on line, I think, 57. Yeah, here. So if you click this, um, the slides should open in the browser. It might take a couple of seconds, especially if you click all the same time um, for it to render, but then you should basically see this. Uh, let me know if it doesn't work. Um, yeah, but uh, let's get started maybe. So yeah, my, my about myself. Um, so my name is Jana. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Donders Institute for Brain Cognition and Behavior in the Netherlands. Um, I use machine learning models to create uh, some type of uh, machine learning model, normative models on large neuroimaging data sets. So I work with brain data. Um, I also study computer science uh, on the side. My background is psychology and neuroscience. Um, and I'm involved in several open source and open science initiatives, um, some from my field, um, then of course, like some around here, like the Turing Way, you might be familiar with that, um, the TOPS initiatives. And I'm also co-hosting a, um, a podcast called Data Talks Club around data science. Um, and I really like cats. And on the right, you see my cat. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, she's very cute. Um, and yeah, so uh, the first part is an introduction to open code. And the learning objectives are um, after this uh, lesson, you should be able to define what open source uh, software is and be able to distinguish it from closed source uh, software. You should be able to list common benefits and challenges to the production of open code and describe how researchers can respond to some of those challenges while maximizing openness when appropriate. And you should be able um, to define the, the function purpose of a software management plan and its utility as a guidebook for everyone involved in a scientific project. Um, let me see, why is this not? Yeah, so um, what is code and what is software? So um, you might be confronted with a couple of terms and I wanted to go you know, deeper into what is actually code and what is software because you often hear them interchangeably. So code is like in general, a structured way of conveying information. Um, the term is not necessarily computer specific. So for example, we have Morse code um, or we have Braille, which is like the, you know, the way how uh, uh, blind people um, are able to read basically. Um, um, and uh, in, in computing, we usually um, are, are kind of um, faced with the task that we write a high level code. So basically code well, that is almost like spoken English. Um, but this has to be compiled into low-level machine language uh, so that the computer can understand it. And um, so we can differentiate between high-level code and low-level code. Then software um, is a collect is collection of programs, data, scripts, and code that are bundled together and executed together. So from my intuitive understanding, uh, software is like a broader package and more structured, and it includes much more than code. Um, software can be open and closed. And then open source software um, is basically software that is openly available and it is distributed with its source code without cost, making it available for others to use, modify and distribute with its original rights and permissions. Um, open source software is often transparently shared in a public repository and sometimes maintained through collaboration. It's the basis for a vast range of research software packages and it is often protected by a license that governs the sharing and the use of the software. Yeah, and then I wanted to go very briefly um, through like a short history of computing and I wanted to highlight um, some figures in the history of computing. Um, so the first one is Ada Lovelace. Um, 
she is uh, widely seen as the first programmer um, because what she did is she wrote instruction for a so-called analytical engine that one of her fellow, so she, she attended a scientific circle and one of her fellow and attendees uh, wrote kind of an, uh, a machine and she, she wrote the first instructions for this machine. And that is what we understand under programming. So writing instruction instructions for a machine. So she, she is considered to be the first programmer. Um, then we have Grace Hopper, who was an admiral in the U.S. Navy, but also um, a computer scientist. She worked on these big mainframe machines, so these computers that filled an entire room. Um, and she has a kind of very interesting hit history because she um, started out in the 1930s and 40s, and she wasn't really recognized for her computing work um, throughout this time. And then she retired, and only after retirement, she had to come back. Um, and uh, basically her, her real career started after that. And she is widely known for widely known for inventing the compiler, which is basically a tool that translates from high level software into low level software. So without Grace, we would still be writing assembling code. So basically just zeros and ones. Um, and like, yeah, her history is also a bit tra tragic because of this, um, you know, this kind of phase where she was not really recognized. She also struggled with alcoholism. So it's it's actually quite interesting. Uh, she's a really interesting figure and also a bit tragic. Um, yeah, so then um, the next one is Margaret Hamilton. Um, you see her here um, next to the printout of the code that she wrote for one of the NASA missions. She was instrumental in the Apollo missions and she got basically, um, you know, the first people to the moon. Um, and then we have Katherine Johnson also working for NASA, and she was fundamental in writing um, the algorithms that got spacecrafts into orbit. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to highlight these figures and also like as an example that really literally anyone from any background can get into coding and write good code. Um, yeah. Um, so then I wanted to um, show you basically what is I called a little bit of a manifesto. Um, so principles behind open code. We have uh, five principles here. They are transparency, collaboration, share early and often, inclusivity and community. Um, and uh, here is the description for it. Um, I, I actually also, um, so most of the material for this presentation is from the NASA um, 101 Open Science Crash Code uh, course, including this one here. Um, so whether you're developing software or solving a research problem, we all have access to the information and materials necessary for doing our best work. When these materials are accessible, we can build upon each other's ideas and discoveries. We can make more effective decisions and understand how those decisions affect us. So that's transparency. Then collaboration. When we're free to participate, we can enhance each other's work in unanticipated ways. When we can modify what others have shared, we unlock new possibilities. By initiating new projects together, we can solve problems that no one uh, can solve alone. And when we implement open standards, we enable others to contribute in the future. Then share early and often. Rapid prototypes can lead to rapid discoveries. An iterative approach leads to better solutions faster. When you're free to experiment, you can look at problems in new ways and seek answers in new places. You can learn by doing. Um, so that's also like from my, my own experience, like the earlier you share something, the earlier you get feedback and the better it gets. Um, yep. Yeah. Then inclusivity and good ideas can come from anywhere and the best ideas should win. Only by including diverse perspective in our conversations can we be certain we've identified the best ideas and good decisions make the decision makers continue to seek those perspectives. We may not operate by consensus, but successfully successful work determines which projects gather support and effort, and effort from the community. And then community. Communities form when different people unite around a common purpose. Shared values guide decision making and community goals supersede individual interests and agendas. And it is kind of a bit idealistic. That's why it's called a manifesto, but I think uh, it's a really nice guideline to strive, uh, you know, to um, when writing uh, code and also making it making it open. Um, yeah. Then, um, so uh, talking about software, and many of you might actually ask, like, uh, yeah, what does software have to do with me? Like, you know, I'm not really writing software. And then, like, I ask you, like, are you really not writing software? So because there are different types of software. Um, so um, I, I'll start with the most high level type of software, which is um, general purpose software. 
So this is a software that is produced for wide use and it can be open or closed. But here I'm talking about uh, the software in your computer, uh, so the Linux kernel, um, browsers, the software in your phone, uh, so this type of software. And I would say it's rather unlikely that, you know, ever in your lifetime, you will contribute or any of us will contribute to this type of software. And I see that point. <laughs> Um, then we have operational and infrastructure software. That is software that is used by data centers and large information technology facilities to provide data services. So that will be um, web apps that you use. For example, your Amazon shopping cart is a web app um, or APIs, um, like you know functions that you can call from your computer via the internet. Um, then we have libraries, and now it's already getting smaller. So libraries are generic, generic tools for implementing well-known algorithms, providing statistical analysis or visualization, which are incorporated in other software categories. And they're rather small. And usually they are created with the idea that someone has done some work and they just either want to distribute it to other people or they just don't want to you know, do it over again. <laughs> um, so they bundle it into a library. An example are uh, scikit-learn, numpy, pandas, or ggplot, or you know any uh, software libraries that you might know. Then we have modeling and simulation software. Um, so that's more like on the algorithmic side, um, <clears throat> software that implements solution to mathematical equations, given input data and boundary condition, like something that fits a model to your data, <clears throat> for example, or info affairs model from your from models from your data. So that would be MATLAB, for example, STAN, uh, or OpenFOAM. I think that's a NASA-specific one. Um, and then we have analysis software that is developed to manipulate measurements or model results to visualize or gain understanding. So that would be, um, for example, R or SPSS or anything that you use um, you know, to run analysis. And then we have, at the bottom, single-use utility software. And I think... We, as like researchers or data analysts, we are most likely to write this type of software. So it's basically written for use in unique instances, such as making a plot for a paper or manipulating data in a specific way. Um, the code or the soft use often uses libraries for analysis, plotting, or reading data and gets included into open science and data management plans. So that would be a software that makes plots for paper or like data analysis scripts. And I think this type of software is also what researchers or like um, programmers often refer to as scripts. So that's basically uh, code, code just in a single file. Um, yeah, and then uh, now we're coming to our first exercise of today, um, and it's around uh, benefits and challenges of sharing code. Um, so um, we are going to go into breakout rooms, and I would like you to discuss um, what are general and personal benefits of sharing code, um, what are general and persons, personal challenges of sharing code, um, if you have already shared code, why? And if you've not shared already code or have not shared code yet, why not? And um, if you uh, find a challenge of sharing code, can you come up with a solution? And uh, if you don't write code, you can also think about um, sharing, for example, the exact details of your method section, you know, that comes clear, like closest to, to sharing code. It's like basically what exactly have you done in your analysis or in your project? Um, let me just stop sharing. Uh, what are questions before we go into the breakout room? Yep, yo. I am curious, um, let's say I didn't identify with anything on the code list that you had, and I thought it was quite good because we got to R and SPSS, and I've definitely heard people say, oh yeah, I'm not a coder, but I write R, and I'm like, how is that not a coder? Um, but what would you say if I wrote formulas in Excel or Google Spreadsheets to produce a plot or to calculate something, is that code? Definitely, yeah. I think any um, any structured way of uh, manipulating uh, kind of, uh, you know, anything, um, definitely, yep. You've definitely written code if you've used Excel um, and also, yeah, Google, Google Plots or whatever. Yep, definitely. Sorry, I also okay. have, a, have one, yeah. 
Uh, okay, so it's regarding the question, the exercise question as uh, sharing code. So we talk about sharing code. Is it like uh sharing it for other people to use or to even use it? No, usually for software developers, we have the GitHub where we can, where is a platform for sharing code. But then the other people that might not be into coding and they might just have um, their work. Um, so in this context now, the sharing of code, is it people actually using your work or sharing the code itself, the source code, and people are actually using it to do something? Yeah, just a little bit of context on sharing codes here. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So I would say anything. It can be on GitHub for anyone to see. It can also just be exchanging, uh, you know, the analysis with your coworker to explain what you've done. Can be as part of a paper in a repository. Um, anything where you talk about exactly what you've done. And um, I think uh, from my personal like I don't want to, you know, take away from your discussion, but from my personal experience, any of these practices, regardless of how much sharing there's involved and with how many people, um, can be like the, the the focus of, you know, questions like, you know, why am I doing this? Do I am I doing it correct? And what are the consequences? Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, that's that's yeah. fine. Yeah. So, so even so, even uh, resources on uh, Zenodo, you would have kept the resources there. Though, that's the part of sharing. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Any okay, other? So, Johanna, yeah, yeah. Can we open the the yeah. rooms? Yep. Yeah. If there's okay. no more questions, yep. Yeah. Okay, so the rooms are open for ten minutes, and we will see you back here in a bit. Like, are the, um, does anyone want to share uh, any insights that they had from their breakout room? Feel also free to note down um, anything on line 129 of the framework pad. Anyone? Or like right also um can also put it down. Alan. Uh do you want to go ahead? I I think you'll uh, hello once again. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So yeah. I think if you share your code. Uh, someone could view it and uh, build up on the code. And also, I think if you share a code uh, and uh, someone can notice if you have bugs in your code and uh, advise you on how to make it better. Yeah. And also, also, I think uh, so if your code is good and... Uh, as someone really appreciates that you've uh, uh, prepared a very good code. I think in case of uh, a gig, he would actually recommend you for the job. Yeah, yes. definitely. Thank yeah, thank yeah. You. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. for those insights. Um, especially, um, uh, um, I'm just writing this down. Um, in the times of uh, GitHub, like having a really nice collated GitHub repository um, with code that you share is definitely like you can put that on your CV basically. And many, um, especially when you're looking like in a job like a job like in the data science or software world, um, definitely. Um, Gibran? Hello everyone, nice to meet you all. Just uh, sharing a few things we were just discussing. And uh, I agree totally with Alan about that point. And just adding something because I guess it's a good point just to share our information, our codes and things like that. But one thing that I'm just concerned is mainly in conflict zones or zones with indigenous species or where we are just creating code to protect something and they can use that formation just to the opposite. So I'm really concerned with this. 
because many of institutions that today it just like want us to share a lot of things or the same type provoke like wars and things like that. So I'm really concerned with this type of information, this type of information just being in the wrong hands. That's it. Yeah, but very valid point, like misuse. Um definitely same, same with you know, all these uh large language models that it just gets sucked into and uh, maybe misinterpreted. Very good point. Thank you for sharing this. Um yep. Um, Yo said she hired someone who once contributed a few lines of code to a GitHub repo in the past. It's fantastic. Um, great. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry, I have one. Yes. Uh, so I was in the same room with Gilbert. So I think it, it kind of summarized what we, the conversation that we had there. But then our, someone ha did have a question, like um, if, uh, if open data is the same thing as open code. And she, yeah, she was coming from the background of, uh, you know, mostly using things, I uh, think from data. So she was concerned. Can we say at this point that open data is the same thing as open codes? So that's a question that we got from that. And uh, uh, other thing was intention and publication. Yeah, so I think Gibbon already said the, uh, mentioned the other one. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, good question. I think um, at this point we are talking in general around op about open information, I would say I would summarize it under that. Um, and so I, I think it definitely converges because like you need data for code and then usually you need um yeah you need code if you have large data so i think at some point like the computer like on your operating system it's the same like literally like it doesn't computer doesn't differentiate between the the execution part and the the data part at all <laughs> so at the on the you know level of bits and bytes it's the same um i uh yeah, I do agree like around the also like the cautionous part. So there's definitely data and code that uh, can be misused or you need to be careful share uh, careful about sharing. And I'll go into that like in a second. Um, thank you all. This was very interesting. Um, are there any other um, share outs or comments? Because otherwise I think we could continue. So I'm sharing my screen again. Um, hello. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, please, um, yep. Yeah. Hello? Yep. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm sorry, before, I'm sorry because uh, I am on my way to my home, but uh, just one thing uh, related to the sharing part. Yeah, personally, um, I think, uh, it's, uh, it's not really good for me as a result because uh, we have got uh, the technology turned back. And uh, in my country, uh, which is Madagascar, uh, we have a kind of uh, uh, problem. And uh, we must. Uh, have uh, a, the best technology to fight against the the flat problem. So personally, uh, I try, I try to to not share the the court. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you were cutting out. Uh, at some point, so it was a bit hard to understand. But I, like, uh, if I summarize correctly, is that you're sharing not your code, and I didn't really get the reason. Joe, did you, uh, did you understand? I thought I did. You say something about piracy, Edmund? Uh, I'm sorry, okay. I couldn't quite yeah. hear either. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah.
maybe if you could summarize it in the chat, that would be perfect. Um, but definitely, yeah, um, just someone taking the code is definitely, um, you know, a problem <laughs> or can be a problem or at least a fear. Um, okay. Um, I'll go, I might continue because that's actually also something I'm talking about. Um, let me find my presentation. So, um, I've also tried to summarize um, some benefits and challenges, but like a lot of them have already been mentioned. Um, so benefits are definitely if you um, upload the code to your analysis or your paper, uh, there's evidence that it gets cite cited more often. Um, uh, you have increased credibility because people, you know, um, see what you've done and they believe in your analysis. Um, it can help your portfolio. Like I said, it really, it's like an advertisement uh, for you um, if you share code uh, or good code or any code really. Um, and it makes the results of your papers reproducible. Um, and uh, you're helping to advance the scientific progress in general. Of course, there are also challenges, and I think we've heard um, some of them already. Um, so that will be, um, if you put up any code, um, you have to think about how you maintain it. So if anyone else wants to use it, they might come back to you with like questions or like say, oh, this didn't work for me or my data. And then usually they expect you <laughs> to find an answer for that. So it's kind of a bit time consuming. Um, we've had like the fear of like scooping or piracy, like someone just taking it and running away with it. Um, uh, although I must say this has never happened to me. Like I've been scooped, but not because my code was online. Um, and, uh, um, also like people sometimes say like, they're really scared that people, other people might find errors in their code and then. You know, if you publish a paper and someone says, oh, the analysis that you did, it's invalid, then, you know, that might also be a fear. Um, and it's definitely more work. Um, but yeah, in general, I would uh, definitely recommend to uh, share code in general or like your analysis. Um, so um, a simple way of getting started with your code um, is uh, using GitHub. So GitHub is a code... Um, collaboration and contribution platform. It's like li literally a platform. You can uh, sign up and get a free account. And um, it, uh, yeah, uh, if you have any code or any analysis, you can just create a repository on GitHub and just dump it there. That's what I usually do. Um, and you can also make private repositories on GitHub. So um, that's also an option, by the way. And um, yeah, you then upload your code to GitHub. Um, you can create a short README. Um, I think this will be also covered in, in like uh, OLS uh, lessons, like how to do that. And describe the project and the uh, execution of the code. And then you should also add a license. Um, other ways, of course, like, uh, thank you for mentioning this is actually like Zenodo or any other platform. You could also share your code or your scripts there. Um, Uh, yeah, and you can also share your data if possible, um, but if not, then only share your code. And I've put uh, an example here so you can click this. This is like uh, one repository that I created for one of my papers and I literally just dumped all my code there. So um, it's not very pretty, but it's there. Um, yeah, then um, when not to share. So there are definitely valid reasons when you should not share your code. Um, and I'm assuming like if you work on some code um, in general, like as part of your project, you might have already a really good idea whether it's a good idea to share your code or not. Um, so some of the reasons that uh, where you shouldn't share your code is for example, um, the code contains personal data. So that is um, like something that uh, you know, affects me a lot because I work with neuroimages. So basically images of the brain that usually also contain facial features. Um, and like machine learning models usually these days are able to, even if the face is, you know, taken out, like to re-identify this person. So that is something um, where you need to be very careful of sharing these type of data um, and code. Um, 
The code incorporates a country's military secrets or dissemination violates national interests or security concerns, of course, but I th I'm assuming if that's the case, you would know. Um, the code incorporates intellectual property or patent and data and information. So that's also another thing. If you want to patent something or, uh, you know, think it's, it's uh, very important that this shouldn't be known before you make it publicly public, um, then also don't share your code in advance. Um, and if there are any institutional policies, or organizational reg regulations that do not permit the sharing of the code. Um, yeah, um, then we should talk about uh, licenses. So um, licenses basically uh, tell anyone who finds your repository um, what they are allowed to do with it and what not. Um, and so if you create a repository and you add no license, that basically means that you hold the, the sole copyright. So you don't need to apply for that. Or don't, you don't need to create a license to not allow anyone to do something because that's the default basically. Um, licenses usually only tell people or you know, more, make it more permissive. The problem is with like not adding a license is if you have like a shared repository, for example, in a lab, um, if there's no license, that means that each of the people that contribute to a repository um, holds the right over their own contributions. So that means that even if you are the, um, you know, the creator of this repository, you're actually not allowed to make changes to other people's work in that repository. So it's actually better to have like a license that governs exactly, um, you know, how you can, how everyone can make changes to that code or repository. Um, and uh, so uh, licenses, <clears throat> they um, range from uh, very uh, restrictive to very liberal or copy left. So we have um, here at the top, um, the type of license is, uh, the, the work is in, in the public domain. That means like all rights are, uh, are granted and examples are CCO licenses. Um, and then we go to more, um, to less permissive, basically. Then we have what we call permissive licenses. Um, that means that you grant use rights um, and forbid almost nothing. It also means that if you, you know, you create something, other people can use it and work on it and sell the results. That's kind of permissive licenses. They allow property, proprietization, basically. So that will be BSD, MIT, and Apache licenses. Then there are copyleft licenses. Basically, they allow also all use rights, but the results or anything that is added on it must stay in the copyleft domain. So you cannot, like anybody who uses it cannot sell it. It needs to, it needs to be still free for everybody, basically. Whatever you do with you know, this repository needs to be open to all still. Um, and then we have proprietary licenses. So that will be your traditional SPSS or MATLAB license or, you know, um, where you get a number and only you are allowed to use the software, basically. Um, yeah. um, so then um, I wanted to just uh, show you. So um, we had also in the big record on this idea of, of like adding a DOI to your repository. So how can you make your own code citable? Um, and uh, this is a GitHub interface, um, if you've not seen that. So this is how a GitHub repository would look like. But GitHub now basically has an option to um, add, um, uh, let me see, um, uh, um, citation.cif CFF file um, that tells people how to cite your repository. So similar to a paper. Um, in addition, you can go to Zenodo and get a DOI, so a digital object identifier for this repository. That all, and like that, you can put that into the citation.cff file, and then people can cite it similarly to a paper. Um, so that's I just wanted to mention that because, like, especially when you work in academia, it's usually good to get citations. Um, that, that makes your uh, repo citable. Um, then I wanted to talk about software management plans and what that is. Um, so um, software management plans are the best way to work with software. Um, and they really detail um, the maintenance and also, you know, how to how this software repo like should will live on the long run, basically. Um, and it uh, is a document that describes how a specific software project is developed, maintained and curated. And here you see uh, different focuses that a software management plan should have or can have. So we have the purpose, and then 
We have an engineering focus that would deal around, you know, how do I version control my software? How is it tested? Is it a package? Um, what is, how do we um, uh, uh, maintain the quality, make sure that the quality standards are met? Then we have documentation. So that will be um, how is our software documented? How, where is, how is it, can it be deployed? And then how can other people uh, contribute like developer documentation? And then more like a project management focus. So that's around how is it going to be maintained? How can it be cited? Where is it located, the repository? Um, what kind of resources do we have for this repository? Um, and then a risk analysis, which uh, might be important if you write software, for example, in the health domain, um, you know, for example, what if what happens if someone uses the software and there's like damage from it, like are we covered for this, for example? Um, and it's usually so a software management plan, like if you apply for grants, um, you need to have one for your software. Um, and it's usually written by the, by the developers, maintainers or other stakeholders of a software project. Um, yeah, and the goal of a software management plan is to ensure that the software is usable and maintainable in the long term. Um, yeah, and then I wanted to add one more thing about open code in the time of LLMs. So this is from last year, but um, basically I think you should be aware that if you put code on GitHub um, or like probably also Zenodo, um, it's very likely that it will end up in an LLM. Um, because the web is just currently being scraped for these large language models. So this was from last year where um, you basically um, had the um, option to opt out of um, a model called the stack by Hugging Face. So I opted out. It was really interesting because you basically, you opted out and after a couple of months, they came back to you and they showed you which repositories from GitHub actually were <laughs> meant to end up in uh, the LLM and then you could opt out, but uh, that's definitely something that uh, you should take into consideration. Also, if you uh, feed anything into at least the non the, the, the free version of ChatGPT, it ends up in the training model of ChatGPT. So maybe don't feed your latest idea that you want to publish <laughs> into LNMs because it will just get sucked into the void basically. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, then uh, key takeaways from this section um, uh, relating um, principles to benefits and challenges are um, making software more open has benefits and challenges which are related. Um, greater benefits typically come with greater challenges. And in most cases, individual scientists and society will both benefit from more open software. Um, and uh, I think thought we could have maybe a five to 10 minute break. So the second section will be much shorter, um, but to, you know, uh, switch off for maybe let's say seven minutes. Um, it's maybe come back at uh, seven past, past whatever it is in your time zone. How does that sound? Cool. Um, then yeah, uh, take the time, get up, stretch. And then we'll back in seven minutes. We'll be back in seven minutes. We just stop. Um, so I think we can uh, continue with the second uh, section of this presentation, which is going to be much shorter actually, but um, we're talking about how you can use open code. Let me make this. Um, and um, after this lesson, lesson, you should be able to um, describe the process of using open code and how um, uh, know how um, you can uh, know some key repositories to find open code and describe how, where, and under which circumstances you should uh, acknowledge or cite code. Um, and uh, maybe you can just uh, speak up quickly uh, or like also put in the chat, like uh, what locations do you already know where you can find code? Anyone?
GitHub, yes, definitely. Anything else? It's all right. Okay, I have some. I have some suggestions, but GitHub is definitely the most Stack Overflow. Perfect. I didn't even think about that. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I'll add that to the list, actually. <laughs> it's such a good idea. Uh, yeah, so I have, of course, also GitHub, um, GitLab, which is similar, uh, Bitbucket, which is also similar. Um, oh, good question. I don't know what license Stack Overflow. ChatGPT, definitely, Perplexity. Oh, we can have all the AI, the new ones. I need to update my presentation. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, our repositories, yeah, great. Um, so many I didn't add. I love this. Um, so I have one. Um, I don't know whether you know papers with code, but it's basically papers that have published also the code, which is really useful if you want to understand a concept. I personally always find it easier to see in code what people have done. So that's the one. Um, uh, then the Journal of Open Source Software is a soft is a is a journal that only publishes code. So um, it centers around code and the um, the papers to the code are usually just a page, um, but it's really focused on the code. Um, Stack Overflow, I have Stack Overflow. Um, you can also reverse engineer packages. So I, you know, just look into the package in, uh, in R or in MATLAB or in whatever you're using, trying to figure out how they did it. Um, and I have here a really nice one actually. So this is a GitHub repo, if you click on this, um, and it has the source code to the Apollo 1 mission, which is like mind blowing. Um, but basically what they use to get the first people on the moon, the first man on the moon, basically. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so here I have a couple of more uh, repositories. You might know some of them. So we had like, think, uh, you know, CRAN uh, for R, then we have the Python package index. Um, there's... Uh, Google open source, so Google code. Um, the Software Heritage Foundation is also really interesting. Like they have these really old code bases there, like for, you know, these main mainframe computers. Um, and uh, yeah, you can have a look. I didn't know all of them. FOSHub is also quite well known with all the, uh, the, the open source uh, packages. Um, yeah, but you can have a look if you're interested. Um, yeah, so then the question is like, if you use open code, like when should you cite it? Um, and uh, you should cite it if it has played a critical part in your research or your project, if it provides something novel, um, and if it impacts the results of your analysis. Uh, so for example, I do a lot of image processing and I usually cite the, um, you know, the packages that I use there because the results of my analysis differs based on the package. So it's, it's really important that you that I cite exactly what I did so to make it reproducible. Um, it's not only to actually acknowledge the person that has written the package, but also to, to make it clear what I actually did. Um, and then how should code be cited? Um, so ideally the code is located in a long-term repository and tagged with a DOI. So then you can just cite it. Um, uh, packages often come with a paper that can be cited. Um, and uh, sometimes also come with a version tag that can be added to a citation. And then I have here some examples of how you can cite code. Um, so software purchased off the shelf would be product name, version, release date, publisher, location. So this is um, an example from the NASA um, 101 Open Science Crash Course. So Super Science uh, version 1.2, December 2012, Research Software, Edinburgh, UK. Um, software downloaded from the web would be product name, version, release date, publisher, location, DOI or URL, download date. This is another um, example from the NASA uh, another NASA course. Um, software checked out from a public repository. Here they have product name, publisher, URL, checkout date, and then repository specific checkout information. Um, so they are using this Augustar die REST uh, software package, which is probably around something around astro astrophysics. Um, but I've added a software checked out from a from a GitHub with a DOI. So that would just be author 
product name, version, type of work, and DOI URL. So here's an example. So Lisa M and bot age, uh, then the year, and the, the product name, the version, and this is like computer software, and then the DOI. Um, yeah, and now we come to our second little exercise. And um, for this one, I would like you to think about a concrete example uh, from a project that the project that you're working on, either for LS or also another project, um, or your research. And <clears throat> what are the two next concrete steps uh, towards making your code or your documentation or your project in general uh, shareable? And uh, before I send you uh, off into breakout rooms, uh, what questions are there around this exercise or around this section in general? Is it clear? Johanna, we have a question in the chat. Yeah. Um, Ezra, do you want to share your question? Yeah, of course. Actually, I have two questions, but I'd rather yep. start with this one. Yep. I mean, you talked about reverse engineering software to be able to understand how they were built and learn from the process. And my question is, to what extent is that legal or ethical? Um, it's as long as it's open source software, um, then you would have to look at the license. So if it's, um, you know, this uh, copyleft license that I, the copyleft license that basically states you uh, can have a look at it, you can do anything with it, but it needs to remain in the public domain. So you cannot sell it. Then it's completely legal to look at it, to do anything with it, to put it up on your GitHub as long as you don't sell it. If um, it's like something like uh, MATLAB, where it says you cannot uh, actually, you know, you, you have a proprietary license, then it might be different. But I do think what I meant is more like for understanding how to write code, not to take it and sell it as your own. So that was more my intent, I think. Okay. Yes. So yes. if I want to follow up with the question, I'll say that so people can actually also reverse engineer into code and try to find maybe vulnerabilities and ways of like creating vulnerabilities for the software and getting access to user information. Is there a way to write code and build software in a way that it cannot be reverse engineered to protect oh. the software? And um, I'm not sure. Like, I, I think that's a fundamental. So you has like a, you has a, an idea. I think that you're getting into hacking then, right? <laughs> yeah. What do you want to say? Uh, Read about obfuscation. Okay. Uh, it's the practice of intentionally making code either hard to read or sometimes just more compact. Because if you, like, rather than having a nice long variable name, let's say you just have a variable X and then the next thing is Y and the next one is Z, and that could be done automatically in compilers. But that's getting very, very technical. There are ways that people try to do that, yes, <laughs> is the short answer. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I'm not saying you should hack code, like, and you also should not hack systems, but like just trying to, like, I was thinking more, you know, if you look in R, you're trying to figure out how the ANOVA function works, just look into the package, how the ANOVA function works. Um, That was more my intent, not like, uh, I had a I had a very interesting, so I was hired for a startup for um a month, and there was a reason why I left the startup afterwards, but they asked me basically to, take code from a GitHub repository and write it in a different language so that they could sell it, which I found borderline illegal, um, which I didn't, which is the reason why I didn't do it. Um, but yeah, it happens. And they said like, they were like, yeah, this happens all the time. Like, just do it. <laughs> Everybody does this. And I was like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for sharing your experience. Yeah. And before we move to the question and answers, I will ask you if I can ask one last question. Yep. Okay, I had this one from the previous section of the presentation, and it's about, it, you told us that when you write code and you want to share with people, you can 
maybe push it to a repository on GitHub. Okay, that's great. And there's a kind of responsibility that you tie to yourself that you are, you are supposed to maintain the code. Because if people want to access your code, which is openly available as per your license, and the code is not maintained, they will usually find themselves like cloning your repository and trying to fix bugs for like one month and make no progress. So the question is, are you obliged to maintain code when you publish it openly on GitHub? And if you think you cannot maintain the code, is it advisable not to share it? Because yeah. you end up misleading people or making them waste their time trying to find solutions. That is a super great question. Um, so I think I have several layers to this uh, to this question. Like, this, like my answer will be have several layers. Like the first one is that's why you should write a software management plan, and it should include exactly this question: like, what is going to happen to the code if you know, let's say you're a PhD student in the lab. What if the PhD student leaves? Like, who is going to maintain the code? Is it, is there going to be funding for this? Are we going to apply in the grant for this? Um, these type of questions. The second question, uh, the second the second answer that I have is like, no, you're not obliged. Like, you just put it out there. What people do with it is, you know, on them. Um, so GitHub doesn't ask you to, and they're also not obliged. Like many people still do it. Um, but I have heard from other people that wrote software, put it out, and then had a really hard times because they didn't do anything but maintaining the software. And you know that, that was only some part of their job. And they also had also other responsibilities, but it can be overwhelming quite a bit. So in my, in my, my personal opinion is like sharing never hurts. Um, and what people do with it, you know, it's up to them. And also a bit then up to you if you want to engage longer term, unless of course you have a good software management plans where for example, you're paid to do this, um, you know, like where your supervisor pays you to do this. That's a different question then, or a different, different thing. Does that make sense? Kind of, but that's just yeah. my, my, my opinion. Okay. Yeah. Good, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for these very interesting questions. Um, before we go for the last, into the last session of breakout rooms, are there any other questions? Um, so again, just gonna yeah, check yep. on time. Yeah. Um, Irene, can... how long did you think you wanted to leave for Q and A for um the like coaching? We need five minutes to close. Um, we could also make it might... like we could not go into breakout rooms and just make it like a, you know, if anyone has an idea like two two steps to their project like for their project how they could make it more shareable, if anyone wants to share. I can also just put one next step. Alan put in the chat that proofreading through the code. Um, definitely. That's a very, very good first step. And we have someone saying um, making a visualization could also be great, a great idea um, to know you understand your code better and everything better. Any other ideas? Sometimes it can also be nice to just share it with your colleague, your lab mate, your friend, getting some, you know, feedback. Does, does someone who is from the same field does the same thing as I do? Do they understand what I'm trying to do? Can also be less intimidating, maybe. Maybe people are tired, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we can also, um, maybe if, if there's no more comments or ideas, um, there is a last section, right, Irene, like a QA. and a is that correct? Yeah, um, they just want to give happy 
a few more minutes for people to maybe yep. share a final comment on yep. code uh, before we move on to the closing. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Ezra to facilitate the last, this last session, section on Q&A. OK. So we're still welcoming any comments or questions, if you may have one, you can feel free to drop it down in the comments or just raise your hand and open your mic. We would love to hear what you have to say about this. And if you have any questions in general about this program, about the presentation, you have questions for Joanna or any questions related to your project or the research you're going through, how you can maybe build a software to help you in your research with no prior software development experience, feel free to ask. I'm sure Joanna have an answer for you. Has an answer for you. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So um, why we yes oh. ask one not not like uh yeah just to ask one so it's regarding I think uh the presentation in Jonah's presentation she did talked about how we have to be careful with the data we put in into G chat GPT uh as regarding the LLM model <laughs> that was really uh that was that was that was new to me yeah I know that chat GPT has their their models they have their learning mod yeah learning models the AIs and all but I think um I think let's just have a little bit of details around how being careful as around how much data to feed into to the internet itself because I mean ChatGPT also has a way of extracting those data from there so how much how much information can you put there to try and protect yourself protect your work yeah because I didn't really see it. I mean yeah and it, we yeah, developer actually use the chat GPT a lot, and I believe it's just a combination of people's knowledge over time that I'm also feeding on. You know? <laughs> so please, let's just have a little bit of details on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. That's actually a really good one. So um, I do personally think that, no, so let's, let's start a different. I do also organize um, a podcast on data science, and we sometimes have um, representatives from large companies. So we had someone from Siemens the other day, and they have a policy in Siemens that they're not allowed to use it because of that reason. So Siemens is really scared that the employees might feed uh, prop, like, um, you know, company relevant and secret information into ChatGPT and it might add up there because, you know, they, they depend on selling this information and they don't want to end it up in ChatGPT. Uh, similarly, I think there was a case of, I think it was Samsung where an employee fed half of the code base into ChatGPT and it like, yeah. It's just now in there. <laughs> ChatGPT now knows this. Um, so yeah, be careful. I, I definitely think that you can use it for like, yeah, writing emails or like, you know, summarizing things. Um, I don't think you as an individual need to be too careful, but if you have like an idea, uh, let's say you're right, you worked on a model, you're writing a paper, I would not feed in my new code that I've developed from scratch that I want to publish into ChatGPT. I would not do that because the next person that might have a question similar to yours might just ask ChatGPT and it repeats what you've just fed in. So... Uh, <laughs> Like uh, I'm, I'm really careful about this. Um, I use it for, you know, like my. English, I'm not a, um, a native speaker in English, so I use it, for example, to make my writing nicer. But I never feed in like code that I've written that I want to publish, or not even like papers, not even full papers. Uh, I don't do that. Um, and it's also as as far as I know, I'm not really sure. Just a free version of ChatGPT. So I think as soon as you're, but. But like you say, it's already, if you put it on the internet, right, it will also at some point add up probably in ChatGPT. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Just to add up to what <laughs> Good News said, um, what if you had the intention to share your code openly on GitHub? Does it allow you to just write the code in ChatGPT? Because that's always that's also a way of sharing. You said the next person that is going to put in the same query is going to get similar results to what you just input. 
Yeah, but then um, if you put it up on GitHub, you would hope that this person acknowledges to you if they use it. In ChatGPT, if you put it in, you don't even know where it's going to end up. And also the person that gets it out doesn't know that it's from you. Sure. Yeah, I think. Okay. Yeah. I think I'll let Irene wrap up the call. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Yeah, no Thank problem. You. Um. Well, again, thank you, Johanna. It, it has been a pleasure to have you. Can we please give a round of applause to Johanna? Please. As you know, one of the experts who also helped develop the NASA materials on which this program is based, as well as um, many other programs that are um, providing open science training. So it's, uh, it's great having you here, Johanna. And also, Esdras, thank you so much for facilitating the session, um, and Joe. Uh, so I just have um, a few comments um, about the coaching sessions. We are starting the second half of the program this week. And the other big component besides the training is the coaching sessions. Um, this is a unique component for OLS and for Nebula. And we're really hoping that you take make the most out of this opportunity to, for example, join Johanna for one or more coaching sessions. You will have time to ask her even more about um, how, for example, your project um, yeah, applies open code or open practices in general. Um, so we shared the instructions on how to join by email. And I just want to share my screen very quickly um, to kind of let, let you all know what we expect you um, when signing up for, for the session. So I'm going to again share my screen. Um, OK, I'm trying to find the right. Tab. And I think it's this one. Do you all see the, uh, um, the table? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna do a bit of zoom. And so this table is the place where you're gonna choose which coaching sessions to join. We have over 20 um, coaching sessions. These are group coaching sessions. Each of these are is going to be lead by uh, an expert. Um, some of the experts that you have met during these coaching sessions and some experts that you haven't met and that are only joining for the coaching. And what you need to do is you need to complete the template. The template is the one that we shared again um, that we left this homework uh, a couple of weeks ago. This is a template that asks you about your name, your work, and the challenges that you have related to open science. And these are questions that your coach is going to read to be able to support you better during the coaching sessions. So once you have this completed, you're going to copy the link. Um, I have my copy here. This is in a copy of the Nebula Cushion template, and I filled in some details just as an example. Um, you need to complete all of this. And once you have this, um, you copy the link, and then you go to the table. And if you want to join, for example, Virginia, you select one free space in these columns, um, and then you paste your link the coaching sessions. And that's the way that you're going to um, kind of, yeah, preserve a spot for the coaching session. If you only write your name, we won't be able to confirm your session because we need to be able to read your answers. And because your coach will be read, will read your answers to know what you expect from this coaching session. So I see several of you have already um, added your names. What we need is that you also add your link to your answers. And until you add your links, then we will share the Zoom link to join the sessions. We have, as I said, over 20 um, spaces for coaching sessions um, in the next three weeks. So there's plenty of space for everyone. 
um, and you can join up to two. If there is more interest, we will add more spaces. But for now, uh, please do go back and add your link instead of your name. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna wait for questions if there are about this. We have one, how do we get to that page? Yeah, so this was in the weekly mail. We shared a link, but I can also share it right now in this chat. And we're gonna share it as well in Slack. So here's the link to the table. Yeah. So, Anyway, that's the um, that's my closing remarks for now. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording and thank you again, everyone, for joining. I'm gonna stay a few minutes for additional questions on coaching, uh, but for now, thank you again, Johanna and Estras, for being here.